Hello, I'm Dr. Hans Toki, and this is another City Insight. Today's topic is the two-tiered structure of American families. Welcome to my students, colleagues, friends, and all you interested viewers. Uh, feel free to comment along the way. Today I'm referencing Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids, The Crisis of the American Dream. Have you ever caught yourself judging a family if they were rich or poor? As if there was no other option between them? This is the foundation of what we're going to discuss here today. Putnam writes, In the 1970s, the two-tiered family structure was closely correlated with race, but since that time it's become increasingly associated with parents' social class more than race. Megan McQuiggan presents a good synopsis of uh, Putnam's book. The author explains how family structures in America are moving away from the traditional two-parent working father household, but these divisions occur across class lines. He argues that in the college-educated upper class, families still look relatively similar to the traditional family, but generally now include a working mother. Putnam asserts that unwed births, divorce, single parenting, and blended families disproportionately occur in the bottom third of American families. This difference has led to two very different tiers of family structures. Putnam uses scissor charts in this chapter, a term he uses to describe graphs that show the widening gaps between the lower and upper class families. Well, let's move on from McGuigan. Using this two-tiered approach, Putnam goes on to give a short laundry list of the rationales of why some stay in poverty and in the breakdown of the family. It's really a handy guide that one could work through in creating broader helping plans for those who one teaches or those of us involved in human services. This two-tiered approach does focus on education as the defining factor alongside the ability to draw an income from that education. With the loss of industrial jobs in certain regions of the country, this certainly plays to a loss of a sense that one can work at the factory and get ahead. Now education becomes the card moving forward in society. Don't you think Putnam's two-tier is really simplistic? I think it's legitimate and important uh, as a method to present what's going on, but families living in poverty are far more complex than this. I think it actually does a little of a disservice, indeed dangerous, to simplify the message too much as it can conveniently push issues off the table. But as a way to introduce and frame the topic, the two-tiered approach does make sense. This leads us to Alice one of the lead characters in Putnam's book. Today I want to analyze various elements in the story, uh, particularly focusing on chapter two of the book, and unpack uh, some of the important things we can learn from it, particularly education, ethnicity, and racism, domestic violence, and the modern woman. Well, let's begin with education. Alice was an educated woman who gained unwanted struggles in life, and these struggles drew her into a poverty lifestyle indicative of the lower tier of Putnam, even though technically she might have been in the upper tier. Uh, in the previous lesson, we've observed how education does impact one's life. So it would make sense that Alice having an education would be more apt to make her effective in creating decisions in how to deal with her health and her abusive husband. We see this in the book. Uh, she does make some wise decisions, but without education, do you think it would be so positive? Likely not. Uh, at times it seems Alice is really too smart for her situation, which leads us to discussing this concept of class that Putnam defines as upper tier and lower tier. Weber, in describing socioeconomic status, notes that how one cannot simply uh, define class based on money, but also such things as education, family, life, social connections, and so on. But there seems to be a disjuncture for Alice from being poor, apparent low class status, to having expertise, smartness, and education in how to make decisions, indicators of the upper class. 
Zimmel, the sociologist, argued against Weber that social class should be defined by one's money and the ability to purchase things. Well, I would argue here in New York City, this more narrow interpretation of class is actually more apt and more accurate in a consumer society such as America, especially here in New York, where one's economic standing really determines where one lives and really who one is influenced by. So then I think we can agree with Putnam that education is one of the definers of class as we notice in this book. However, it does get a, uh, confusing because Alice is smart and because she's educated, she apparently should not be poor. Poor people aren't smart. At least that's the way the stereotype goes. So to this degree, Putnam proves a point that effective education is critical to help people who live in poverty find ways not only to survive, but to work their way out of it. Alice might be smart, but her smartness needs to be supplemented with education. Let's move on to ethnicity and racism. Alice consistently references her Jewish heritage in this reading uh, and has this strong sense of community of the past and her history uh, in connection with something despite her immediate circumstances. Roots are an important element for those who face crises in life. For instance, ethnic cultures are rampant in impoverished communities uh, where food celebrations, religious celebrations, parties, and festivals are so important in identifying where one fits and where they come from and who they're a part of. Sadly, if one becomes disconnected from these ethnic and cultural roots, it's difficult to find a sense of belonging. For several years, I've taught about this and the importance of ethnic ties in the neighborhood and its links to ethnocentrism and racism. You know here how she feels disappointed because of the, dis the, the, the discrimination really she's feeling and the segregation she's suffering. Well, it comes from people who are ethnocentric, seeing only their way, and then racist looking outward saying, we don't want you as a part of our group. So her strong Jewish root do not fit with the environment she finds herself in, a non-Jewish one. So disconnection from one's sense of roots and community can be a really painful and lonely experience as we see here. But paradoxically, it becomes a joyful one in remembering your Jewish roots. One can think back to where they came from as that great moment in life, despite the crisis I have here. Why is this important? Because we've seen the rise of black classes and Hispanic classes, even here in New York City, where they rise out of poverty to break the stereotype. For instance, the Harlem Renaissance in New York in recent times shows how blacks who have grown up post-civil rights have succeeded economically and socially, and now they carry significant influence in the city and in public service. They're moving back into Harlem and renovating the brownstones and increasing real estate values. An interesting element of this that I've had from students, particularly from Caribbean descent, is the complete family structure is still very strong and important. It's there together as an ethnic thing. Caribbean families, apparently, according to my students, stick together. Thus, Putnam very much could make the case that the two-tiered structure is very active outside the typical upper-class concept that uh, Putnam really brings to the book. We have upper tier Hispanic and black families, Arab, Asian, and so on, and lower tier families. Within this, I think it's good to highlight Alice and Jewish food. We all like food, don't we? Indeed, food culture is a defining symbol for a community, particularly an ethnic one. Uh, Ruby Payne in her amazing framework for understanding poverty shows how food is a clear definer of material culture of class. She says that for the wealthy, the primary goal is presentation, cute little food in the most significant, beautifully way presented. For the middle class, it's nutrition. I want all my food groups in my meal. For the poor, it is amount, because I don't know where my meal is gonna come from tomorrow. Linking food then to ethnicity further defines social groupings based on class.
Dignity in one's ethnicity is being able to keep uh, to their strongholds of culture that exist within every society and even the poor. For instance, the family meal then emerges out of their uh, culture to become the defining moment for them. An example of this might be an African-American uh, meal that's with food born out of slavery now being served at a holiday meal as a defining uh, ideology of who they are. Rice and beans for the poor, uh, Mexican might be a way to tie together who they are in the world. Certainly for a New York Irish immigrant, corned beef brisket on St. Patty's Day is a signature of their past as they think of the potato famine and the cheap boiled beef they had to eat when nothing else was available. So here we see in food a culture that is a very strong place to find dignity even amongst the poor with their unique recipes, whatever scraps they can gather. Can you see here how someone who does not have a family to eat with that engages their ethnic culture can feel lost and alone? Now it states that Alice did not have any problems with racism uh, even though she was living in this diverse environment and she faced old judgment from others. She probably was lucky. This is really an ideal, because sadly, in many of our communities, racial strife is a daily reality. So while it might not be true for Alice, it surely is true for others. So I'm not gonna invite you to my meal, because this is our meal and you're not invited. You see how food can be kind of a definer also of racism and ethnocentrism. Well, how do people judge one another? It really is different based on social class. The capability for the wealthy to cover up their family problems and their structures, even racial ethnic issues going on, uh, is more possible because they have private ties behind their own walls. So the family meal is hidden from everybody else. This is not so easy in poverty where they eat community meals and everybody knows everybody else's name, as Oldenburg said in his great book. Uh, it's an important counter here that with everybody being exposed to everybody else and everybody else's business in this small community, uh, the shock value is not as extreme in poverty that you have broken families. We talk about it. Everybody knows everybody's business. So indeed, they don't have the ability to cover it up as takes place in the wealthier one. So our perception may be that the wealthy family is together because they cover better and their family meals are not exposed to everybody else. Whereas in the community of the lower class, eating in larger groups, we expose each other because we know each other's names. Well, let's move on to religion because it's a social tie in a community. Being Jewish, Alice has this religious identity, even if it might be a secular belief. This diminished sense of religion may have a significant role really to play for certain people groups. And, you know, we know this uh, in cities, while well, religion isn't as important for many people. However, we cannot make this case in the African-American community, nor Hispanic communities, or many others, where religion plays a significant role in defining the cultural and social ethos of their societies. So how to account then for the breakdown of the family in these religious environments? Income certainly must have something to do with the stresses that come from being impoverished and its extenuating and ancillary effects on that person. Putnam's comment that the collapse of the traditional family often a definer of ethnic identity and sustaining of community culture over the family holiday meal is the cause of these two tiers in America. Putlam believes this. Though well, I still say, is it overly simplistic? What do you think? Our next discussion is on violence and domestic abuse. Domestic violence does not happen based on race, religion, or social class. However, one certainly could make the case that societies that celebrate a strong patriarchal figure would be more accepting of mistreatment of women than in a more inclusive society. Is there a difference between verbal abuse and physical abuse? 
In the Gervaisian model, he argues that those who grow up in an extremely abusive environment, and I would say physical is more dominant here, can reform about 70% of their personality. Someone who's been extremely abused does not really know who they are. What we see here is Alice in a very matriarchal style, which is not uncommon in certain communities. Though the Jewish community certainly has a strong sense of a mother's leader, we really see this uh, as a more stronger belief system in African American families. It's not uncommon to find the strong mother or the single mother. Uh, though it might not seem peculiar, it's really not that uncommon in communities of poverty. So why is this important? While the abuser can then dominate in a family like this, which leads us to a conversation on black men, non-marriage, and single mother families, especially in its penchant for male violence in some African-American subcultures. It is true for the black male who lives uh, in very racial segregated environments. I think the jail is the worst of these. Uh, the prison perpetuates a whole level of difficulty. We need to consider the, the future of the black community, really, in regards to its men. Dubois was interesting in claiming a top 10% would lead the black community a century ago. So this seems true today that the black male leaders are highlighted within the community. But young black men who cannot succeed at this level and be a good father gain deeper destruction and distress. Many find their homes in a gang. Others become uh, wife or girlfriend abusers. I think this pattern can also be seen in other cultures. But as noted from the original commentary on ethnic and racial stereotypes, we also know that many young men are succeeding today. So it's not fair to claim that all young men will be abusive like Alice's or the stereotype we get of the violent young black man. Bringing in the concept of the abused wife, allowing the abused husband back home or returning to the home of the abused husband is also important here. It's true and it's not uncommon at all when one perceives their worths off alone, they'll then return and cycle back to that abuser. Further, if there's economic pressure, they'll push even further so I love, I become abused, I love, I become abused, and so on and so forth. This was especially true with one of my students who worked in a women's shelter in dealing with undocumented immigrants, where the wife did not have status, but the husband did. Often the case would be that the wife would return to the abusive husband because of the fear of her immigrant status. She wouldn't even disclose her name uh, or location or stay in the battered woman's shelter suspicious that she might be exposed to immigration authorities. So the recidivism back to an abused home was common. Let's move to the modern woman. Alice remained a woman of dignity, humor, and intellect, despite the fact that, as Putnam wrote, New York's a bitter place for a woman of her class and color, my city is a bitter place for some. The feminist is an interesting issue here, especially in light of the new millennial generation where more women are going to college, populating jobs, uh, often becoming the main income earner in the home, and particularly in uh, places such as healthcare, education, and so on and so forth are dominating these sectors. Alice though, being smart, with the story being set in the early 1900s, did not have this feeling of progress, despite how she showed elements of being a strong woman. Claudia Sanchez, one of my students, quoting Putnam says, the gender and sexual norms have changed and the stigma against premarital sex and non-marital birth isn't as much as it is anymore. The exploration of the shotgun marriage has broken the link between procreation and marriage. Really, things have changed. So describing the way women articulate their careers in this new two-tiered family reality shows that by delaying the bearing of children in the family structure, uh, one can also be an older family. With the divorce rate declining, this also becomes an important statistic uh, that brings uh, forward the idea that uh, it's more common now 
to uh, not be divorced, but also not married. This really isn't explained well in the book at all, and I don't think it's the intention of the book. But I think we do have to address things such like the use of contraceptives, financial uh, dependence, uh, lower marriage rates, uh, the rise of the older single adult, non-attached sexual relationships, and the shift of family groupings that don't fit the typical styles. These are all influential in uh, shifting what the modern woman is. Putnam goes on to celebrate and admire the strength and stick to of Alice in trying to raise her son and daughter despite the severe struggles they're having. But she's free from that abusive husband, which would have been worse. So the tie in here between the modern woman disconnecting from the abusive husband is critical to this story that Putnam is telling. The question of the rise of the breakdown of the family may be more about people being free to express their authentic reality rather than living behind a social curtain where marriage issues really are not effectively dealt with. I think some hide, but in poverty, it comes out in the open. Alice, according to Putnam, is one of the hardest working people he met. So while being this modern woman, 1990s circa, is also very strong working. So he extrapolates an idea that the poor struggle harder to make ends meet, where wealth doesn't work so hard. I'm not sure I can buy all of that, because there's wealthy people who also work extremely hard. Indeed, some of them live in this complex where I live. But the poor also work very, very hard. So I think uh, this idea of the hard work ethic, very American dream, does exist in poverty. The problem becomes, without education, you can't rise out of it, and you keep working and churning without much success. The person of wealth can rise. What I'm saying here is it's difficult to make the statement that one group works harder than the other. But what is true is the upper class or the middle class, when they work harder, the potential for increasing wealth is greater than the one in poverty. So education here really is the track for success. For a hardworking woman like Alice, the possibility is promising of a future where she can make it. We don't know from this chapter if that's what happened. We'll see later on in the book. So my concluding remarks. What do you think about these two-tiered structures? Is it too simple? One could make the case there's a vast difference between the millionaire and the $200,000 earner in this upper group. Similarly, a vast difference in the lower tiered groups. So it, I think it's too simplistic to do two things, but it makes for a good structure for us to understand a simple truth. But we have to understand that there's many variations of income. We have to be sure not to simply place everybody into one simplistic co so cohort. Uh, and I would say perhaps Putnam does injustice to really truly understanding this idea. One of my students used the phrase that there's two kinds of people in the world, the wealthy and the non-wealthy. Let's be careful with this. I know it's a tidy descriptive to support his book thesis, but I think we need to be more savvy as educated people about this. Elsewhere in this commentary, I've noted this two-tier approach of Putnam also seems socially, really socially and technologically simplistic. And we may actually have bought into this idea that there's really only two kinds of families, the rich and the poor, when indeed there's many, 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 many different kinds of people and careers and tracks that people are on. Though Alice remains and retains in her dignity in being poor, we also know that it's more likely that someone is going to react negatively to being poor. The culture of poverty drives people into a more fatalistic attitude. And this positive sense that Alice brings it might demonstrate the possibility of greatness, but it also tells us that there's no one single stereotype. There's no one Alice that is true for all women. So finally, I think it's important for us to support and help the women who are in trouble. The Alices of the world, they are such treasures. 
for all of us. I'm Dr. Hans Tokyo, and this has been another City Insight. Please feel free to leave your comments. I'll see you next time.